if somebody's listening to this or watching this and they want to be able to get a good idea of the state of their mental health, what are some of the best ways to do that? Oftentimes, if we can just find a little bit of peace, you know, sit with ourselves and clear our minds, we can start to invoke compassionate curiosity. It just means looking at ourselves and being able to acknowledge or take in what we see. And often we have answers to those questions like, am I doing okay? Right? Am I feeling okay? How am I taking care of myself? What do I feel about my life and my future? Am I hopeful? Am I optimistic? How am I sleeping? How are my relationships? I mean, they're basic questions, but they're a way to take our own temperature of just how am I doing? And, and it's remarkable the answers that can yield, right? Just such a simple process, but very often we don't do that. You know, we're on the go and we're moving from one thing to the next. And often I think we're afraid to do that, afraid of what we'll find and that we'll find things we know are there that worry us, but that we don't know how to address. So part of it is just being so busy in the modern world. And part of it is avoidance if we don't know what we're going to do with the problems we might find. So if we get to a place of peace and we're able to be content with where we are and we're thinking about our life and things, what should we be paying attention to, to be able to better understand if there is something going on with our mental health? Peace and contentment. These are things we may strive for, right? And strive for across time. This idea of just finding a few moments of quiet, you know, just being able to shut everything else off and just sit with ourselves, right? And we can look at ourselves from the perspective of you think about work, love, and play, which are common themes throughout mental health. Like, what are we putting our energy into? And again, that could be work that comes home with a paycheck, or it could be growing a garden or taking care of someone. What are we doing where we apply ourselves and we make something around us better? And the care and concern between people or people and animals or even the garden that we're growing. Like, you know, is there love inside of us or love between us? and others? Do we have a sense of fulfillment? And we're living in a sense of aloneness. You know, work, love, and play is just things that are, they're about having some freedom inside and not having to feel constantly under stress and constantly worried. There are three great areas to take our own temperature in and to see, do I feel okay? Or can I see or tell what's missing? Do I hate my job? Do I feel like I'm belittled in my relationship? Am I just unfulfilled and lonely? And it's these things that if we stop and we look at them, we can really make change. What do you think are some of the hidden signs of mental health issues that people aren't aware of? A lot of times it's sleep disturbance. We tend to look at, often at sleep as separate from our mental health, but it's really part and parcel of our mental health, which kind of feeds into how we sleep. But then how we sleep is kind of a baseline determinant of so much about us. So one aspect is we can take stock of our sleep. We can take stock of our self-care and we can take stock of our internal dialogue. So like, am I taking care of myself? Do I know that hey, I'm not eating well and I'm out of shape or I know I'm miserable, but we're just kind of trying to put one foot in front of the other. And often a tremendous window of insight can be to think, what am I saying to myself in quiet moments? You know, whether it's in the car, it's in the shower, it's walking from one place to another. These times when we are with ourselves, what goes on in our minds and sometimes just stopping and listening to our own internal dialogue can tell us so much. We often are so outwardly directed at trying to do things, accomplish things, get to the end of the day so that we can start the next one or get through the stress of the day with that, hopefully with there being no more you know, frightening news, right? That we don't stop and look inward. And it is remarkable how much we can learn from that basic inquiry. And so many people struggle with negative self-talk, limiting beliefs, the way they talk to themselves and look in the mirror. Is that like a telltale sign always of the state of mental health or can people without having severe mental health issues still struggle with negative self-talk? It's not an indicator of severe mental health issues. You know, in fact, people can have very negative self-talk and not even meet criteria for a mental health diagnosis. Certainly, negative self-talk is going to take away from our lives. Like it predisposes to mental health problems, to depression, to anxiety, to panic attacks, to behavioral changes in us, to loneliness and isolation, to not thinking highly of ourselves. And that can have all sorts of effect from someone who just loses a good opportunity, you know, to someone who becomes deeply depressed because what is inside of us is often running over and over and over. And it's there 
for a reason. So that person who's saying to themselves all the time, like, I'm a loser, I can't do good enough, or no one likes me, or, you know, it's coming from somewhere. And it's indicative of something like seeing, you know, a plume of smoke and knowing that there's a giant volcano under that, like, there's so much underneath of that to explore and understand the change. And really, by doing that, we can change the climate within ourselves. So the self-talk is very important, whether it's associated with identifiable mental health problems or just not living as good a life as we could. Is the negative self-talk and the way we talk to ourselves, does it normally come from like our current living state or is it typically from trauma, like being bullied or the way that our parents talk to us? Like what have you found to be the root cause of that? Because very often it's arising from early in life trauma. Now, again, that's not always the case, but the roots of negative self-talk are very often in trauma. And the earlier on in life we experience trauma, the more likely it is to be pervasive and to have a greater impact. And again, that's not always the case, or it can sort of get confusing because the negative self-talk might be identified inside the person about something like the bad relationship that I'm in, for example, right? And person will think, okay, that's that's what I'm going on over and over. You're not good enough or no one's going to like you. Or, you know, if you did just did better, you know, that person would treat you better. So it seems to be anchored to something really proximate. But why is that proximate thing going on? Why is that person, for example, tolerating an abusive relationship? This is one example. And the roots are often deeper than that. So even when we're identifying something that's more recent, it's important that we look at where did that come? from? Like what might be the roots of that? So we're going to peeling away layers of the onion. And it's not as if they're always more layers, right? We can get to a place where we have a reasonable understanding that, oh, you know, a certain way that I was treated maybe back in high school led to a certain set of thoughts about myself and kind of selling myself short, right? And that's how I find myself in a job I don't feel good about, in a relationship that, that isn't fulfilling. And those might be the problems now, but they're coming from something earlier. And then often we see the patterns that have been in our lives that just happen repeatedly often that we can change. And part of this is identifying that negative self-talk and say, what does that mean? And, and how do we change that? And so if you're saying that like at the root of a lot of these mental health issues is trauma, and then the way that negative self-talk and trauma are related. How do you, how do you define what trauma is? Because it's become such a buzzword now and you're hearing a lot about small T, big T. I think back in the day, trauma was seen as this just massively traumatic event when you were younger. How do you define trauma? We have to settle upon a definition. As you said, when when a word has too many definitions, it it becomes meaningless. We don't know what it means. So we have to set out a definition and the definition is a hard science-based definition. It's not a soft definition. Oh, something stressful or something happened to that person they didn't like. Trauma is an experience that overwhelms our coping mechanisms and leaves our brains different as we move forward. So there are brain changes If it meets this definition where it rises to the level of changing our brains, we see this clinically. Tools of modern neuroscience can show us this. And on the other side of trauma, as defined this way, we are different. We are more avoidant. We can have negative self-talk inside of us that we didn't have before. Our whole views of the world and ourselves can change and our views of the past can change. So when trauma rises to this level, it's not only changing our present and future, but it's also often changing our memories of the past. So something that might have seemed very impressive and joyful in the past now can be seen as a mockery or an insult or a failure. It's remarkable how we lose control of our own narrative and even our memories. We lose control of our past through trauma in the present, through these brain changes. And it's not just acute trauma. You know, we started studying trauma through military trauma. So something acute and terrible that has happened, which is absolutely true, a car accident, death of a loved one, an assault, but trauma can also be chronic. So these brain changes can come from, for example, chronic denigration, you know, chronic bullying, being seen as less than based upon a factor of self, race, religion, gender, sexuality. The the chronic denigration can create the same brain changes and we can have these changes inside of us vicariously. You know, thank goodness we can be empathic, right? We can relate to one another and feel compassion, but that also can be a route through which other people's trauma can change our brains. 
how does trauma actually change the brain? Like, how does it change the neuropathways? What does it do to our neurotransmitters? I think the audience would really appreciate understanding more about that. Of course, it's so complicated what goes on inside of our brains. And there's so, so much that we do not know. But we do know enough through modern neuroscience and modern psychiatry to see, for example, that pathways of fear become more accentuated. So as an example, if one sees a new face, instead of seeing a new face with curiosity, one may perceive threat where threat is not there. So that's just one example where vigilance pathways, so pathways that run through the amygdala, which is part of the brain that is kind of grand central station for negative emotion inside of us, you know, becomes much more accentuated. The brain focuses on it more. Mechanisms that clamp down on distress and say, okay, I know that distress is there, but I can get my arms around it, put it to rest, and then move in another direction that can move me forward. We decrease our ability to be able to do that. And think about the immune system and our endocrine system. These are systems that affect us from head to toe. It's what's circulating in our blood and affecting the climate within us. So we're more likely than to become ill. We're more likely to have heart attacks and strokes and cancer because the systems inside of us that are governing us in our brain and from head to toe become changed. And we can see that there is evidence for it. Now it's quite pervasive. There's so much evidence that we don't necessarily look at when we're not defining trauma or we're thinking that it's a lighthearted concept or everyone has trauma somewhere or another. Right? What we're not doing then is honoring that science tells us there are changes in your brain and in your body. Those changes make you different and those differences predispose to less happiness in life all the way through to earlier death. And so we've talked about some of the downstream effects of trauma, whether it be getting into unhealthy relationships, changing the brain, negative self-talk, like where else do you see this going if trauma goes unhealed? Like where does somebody, what does somebody's life look like? What I think ends up happening in individuals and often in societies, right? Because I think there's, there's an extrapolation of this to a lot of the conflict I think we see rising to the fore, not just in our society, but in societies around the world where we are more isolated and we are less open and receptive to thoughts, ideas from the outside. So if I have one opinion and you have another, and we're not living you know, with this sort of yoke of trauma changes around us, then we're much more likely to listen to one another. Right? Or if we disagree, to decide, hey, I disagree with your, with your opinion, but I learned from the conversation and we move forward as opposed to the isolation that leads to conflict, to, to uh, oftentimes to aggression in the sense that if you don't agree with me now, you, you pose some threat to me. Right? And, and that sort of defensiveness, that perception of threat leads to aggression, which is why we see much less in the way of public dialogue and more of people just uniting around like, look, this is what I believe. And this is what people who believe what I believe think. And like, that's that. And we're against all of you people who believe something different. Right. And then we start making divisiveness. And, and this happens in societies, of course, but it happens in individual lives where people become more isolated. The reflexive response to trauma is one of guilt and shame. So those brain changes that we're talking about all happen in the context of guilt and shame. So it is a reflex to trauma. In my own life, you know, I've written about the loss of my brother to suicide. And as I, years down the road, really reflected back on that, I could absolutely see as an immediate response of shame. How has this happened? What is wrong with us? What is wrong with me? Right? In a sense, a, a way that makes us defensive and feel less valuable, less safe. And then we tend much more to isolate. And what ends up happening is people predisposed to decreased role performance. That person who could do really, really well and have good friendships and a great romantic relationship and a good job, it's not quite what's happening. You know, it's, it's a stale relationship or it's unfulfilling or it's even abusive and their job function isn't good. And, and the shame, which fuels the negative self-talk, comes to the fore, reinforces these negative brain changes. So you can see how there's a vicious cycle that happens in individuals and societies and progressively limits us and predisposes to conflict. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dr. Gabor Mate, but he's been on the podcast and been a favorite. And he talks about 
trauma being the root cause of addiction. And I know with my own background in struggling with drug addiction, I know trauma played a big role. There's a lot of dialogue around the cause of addiction. Do you believe that that trauma is also at the root of things like drug addiction? I do in very, very many cases. Yes, of course, there are exceptions to all rules, but in the, the majority of cases of drug and alcohol abuse and addiction, the root is in trauma. Because when we feel so desperate, there's a misery or a fear inside of us or a sense of inadequacy, a sense of vulnerability, what we will do. I mean, humans do this in all situations. If we are feeling desperate, we will choose what soothes us in the short term. Right. The idea that if an elephant steps on your foot, then the only thing you want is the elephant off your foot. And if you get the elephant off your foot in a way that has long term consequences, that's not what you're thinking of in the moment. Right. And very often when people tell their stories of how the addiction evolved and you really have a person tell their story, not just, oh, like, when did you first use that substance? But like, what was going on inside of you? What's the person's history? What you'll see over and over again is a desire to soothe some misery or fear inside. And the substance is beckoning to do that in the short term. So what soothes today, right, makes my life a little easier today, but it's not soothing me tomorrow. So I'll, I use it again tomorrow, right? Because I feel as desperate tomorrow as I did today. And then it takes on a life of its own. And I think to prevent everything from heart attacks to drug and alcohol, addiction, we would look at trauma and where it leads people and how it can lead us to the desperation of, I just need some relief in the short term, right? And, and the, when we're thinking that way, we're not thinking to the long term. And that's how addiction very often develops. If somebody's listening to this and they're like, all right, I definitely think that there's something that's gone on in my life that has caused some trauma and I'm experiencing some issues with my mental health that I'm now aware of that I want to somehow address. Do you think there are things that people can do on their own to start? Or do you think that it's 100% necessary to go see a mental health professional right away? I mean, there absolutely are things people can do on their own. Thank goodness, because access to good mental health help is so limited the world over. It's certainly limited in this country with the dysfunctional healthcare system that we have. So yes, th thank goodness we can help ourselves without necessarily having professional help. Now, of course, if a person is having thoughts that they don't want to be alive or, you know, direct thoughts of suicide or, you know, unable to function, I mean, there are times we need professional help. Absolutely. But most of the time, what we can start with is just the reflection upon self that can come through a, a life narrative. I mean, if you think about how in some ways, both how simple and complex a lot of what we're talking about is. Like the idea of sitting with myself and thinking about what's going on inside of me and what my dialogue is. It may seem so simple, but often we don't do it. Right? The idea of a life narrative of, you know, what were things like when I was younger? What, what did I think? You know, where did I think my life was heading? How did I feel about life? What did that change over time? Right? What, what happened next? What, how does the story unfold? And And very often it will lead a person to identify and realize how much they have changed. So the person who felt optimistic about life and, and had a history of taking on new challenges, right? And, and doing well at the things that they tried. You know, the person who you might think, ah, oh, might not really try that sport, but they went out and tried it and they did well. There's often histories like this in people that they forget, right? Because after trauma and the negative dialogue inside of, you know, I'm not going to do good enough. I never have done good enough, right? That people will then back map that this is always the way that they have been. And I tell this story, I really think it's so, so important as a root into this of a young woman who had won an award at some point in high school in her life for being smart and being capable. And it was a real feather in her cap. And it said that she could go somewhere and she could do things that weren't expected of her, given where she came from and what the environment was around her. And she saw that with pride and hopefulness. On the other side of the trauma that changed her brain, she saw it as a mark of mockery and shame. There's the best you'll ever do, right? Here's an award you can put up on your wall as you're lamenting how awful your life is, right? And she had no idea that she had ever seen it differently, right? And this is not a one-off 
story, right? This is what goes on inside of us. And we're not going to know that there is a story of us. And we may have lost the thread of that story unless we go back and think about our lives. And often that means talking to people who know us or knew us, you know, trusted others about who we are or even who we were, how we may have changed. It's remarkable how much we can learn if we do a little bit of investigative work about ourselves, which starts with our own minds and our own memories. So the idea that somebody has to just sit on a couch and get like psychoanalyzed by a therapist is not necessarily the case anymore. No, and very often our mental health resources that are meant to help and very often do not help. And again, I'm not trying to be critical of people in the field. There are many, many people in the field doing the best that they can, but we live in a system that wants to polish the hood right, when there may be problems in the engine. So a person who is burdened by prior trauma and the impact it's had on them and what that may have meant, for example, within a family system, right? What were things like in that system? Why were things so bad? How did my view of self change? Of How was I harmed within this system? What did I feel when I was afraid in the family, instead of going there, often there's just a symptom inventory. Okay, your mood is lower. Okay, well, we can we have an antidepressant for that. And okay, so if your thoughts go here, shift them to there, right? Where very often the systems are so limited in what they are able to do, either through access or through the orientation of the system, that getting help can help. But getting help often does not help. So look, we've got to start within us because even if you're going for help, you have to know what's going on inside of you and be an advocate. And if someone is talking about how, well, if you think about this, think about that, and we're all in the surface in the present, for a person to know, like, this isn't helping me, right? Like, what I need is I this thing that happened to me or, or that, that changed and I felt different. I have to talk about that. We have to understand ourselves to some significant degree, even if we're going for help or, you know, there's a risk that the help does the opposite for us or certainly doesn't help us. And if we go for help and it doesn't help us, right? Then we can feel a sense, again, a sense of failure, right? And and often you'll see that in mental health. This person failed this psychotherapy, failed this medicine, right? And that's what we're leading people to take away when help doesn't help them. And often help doesn't help because the help is inadequate. I'm understanding that a big part of addressing and improving our mental health comes down to self-awareness and getting deep in thought about our own behaviors, our own habits, our own history, that can be overwhelming sometimes when somebody just thinks to themselves about what they've gone through or what they're experiencing and they become aware of it, but they're like, well, now what do I do with it? Do you have any tips for somebody that gets just super overwhelmed and they start to think about their, the state of their life or their mental health so that they can self-regulate and not turn to things like substances to self-soothe? And, and I want to emphasize one aspect of this is that people don't have to go in depth. You know, it is not good if you if there's something when you think about it, you know, you, you really feel like you're in that moment or people can feel heart racing and, you know, just the, the sense of fear inside of them. It, person doesn't have, it's not good for us to stop and dwell on that. So so a, a lot of times we can think about ourselves. We can often write down, right? We can write a, a little narrative and something that we can kind of then put aside. So we don't have to go to the level of depth that may make real misery for us. And so that's one aspect of, of preventing that sense of despair, you know, and another is often talking with other people, right? So, so that there's some outlet when we talk with other people, it is very, very different what happens inside of our brains than if we're just thinking to ourselves, you know, which is why you can see a person who's very productive and capable in the outside world who just has the same thought going over and over and over again. And normally they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do the same thing over and over again in the outside world, but we will do it in here. Whereas if we're writing even can do it or talking with someone, then different aspects of the brain come online that may be, for example, problem solving aspects. So an example could be to take stock of ourselves. If I feel like there's this thing I can't look at, or I know I turn away from it, or when I think about it, I, my heart starts to race. You know, we can think about ourselves saying before it then, what was I like before the, what qualities you know, did I have when I was younger than that or before that? Are those qualities still in me? Am I calling upon them 
you know, in me. You'd have a good sense of humor that now is dark and cynical. You know, for example, we can identify aspects of self that are still in us and can be rediscovered. I mean, often that can be a source of hope for someone who is feeling so distressed about looking at something difficult. And there are helping resources, whether it's friends, family, professional help, clergy, like there are people around us who will help. So we don't have to be alone with it, but in order to not be alone with it, we have to get it out of here, right? So we do have to think about what it is and do something external, whether it's writing, or talking so that we begin to get out of the closed system of our brain that often is lost in this loop of fear, guilt, shame, despair, even just confusion within us. And a lot of times I think what can happen is people become almost married to their trauma and they identify, they have a sense of like identity and purpose with it where they like kind of either use it as a badge of honor or they have it as a chip on their shoulder. What are the dangers of doing that for a long period of time? Oh, the dangers of doing that are tremendous, right? The identification with the trauma, again, not always, but then often becomes a reason inside the person for why things aren't the way they want them to be. If that didn't happen to me, I'd be able to have a better job, right? If that didn't happen to me, I wouldn't be in these abusive relationships, right? If that didn't happen to me, these people would be nicer to me and wouldn't be bullying me at work. And, you know, that can promote a sense of what sometimes gets called learned helplessness, right? The sense of, oh, like that happened and now this is the way I am. And that is not true. And I think a very, very powerful message that is worth really emphasizing is it is not true that, well, then we are changed and this is the way that we are. So if we start over identifying with the trauma, then it can become part of our story that explains why we're not making the change in our lives that we need to make in order to be happy or healthy. And when it becomes a chip on the shoulder, then it's kind of a different version instead of the aggression going inward. Well, this is just me and I can never be any better, right? Part of the attempts to regain some power or some soothing inside can be through aggression towards other people. I mean, for example, it is not true that everyone who is abused goes on to abuse others, right? But, but there is a strong trend of that. And you think, why, why would that be? And, you know, unprocessed trauma creates terror in people and people can identify with the aggression as a way to be safe, as a way to be powerful, right? The person who made the trauma is the person who had all the power and the terrified person who was on the receiving end of that, if they're not dealing with it, coping with it, talking about it, regaining a sense of strength in self, then there can be a pull to be safe, to be powerful by identifying with the person who made the abuse, which ultimately can mean being like them and, and carrying that abuse along to another person, right? So, so again, these are things, they're just examples of things that are very damaging to self and others that come through over-identification with the trauma as opposed to curiosity about the trauma in the context of curiosity and hopefulness about the self. And I want to emphasize here that people do get better when doing this. It's not as if, oh, this is theoretical and like anything negative that happens to a person is trauma and then that just goes on and that's that. No, it's a hard science concept of what trauma does to us and how it changes us and also how we can go and use methods right? Some of them within us. We're talking about communication with other people, writing, understanding, professional resources to really change. And that's the message of hope that if we understand this, we can change our lives. And people who've been in abusive relationships or had dead end jobs or for a long, long time and have identified with that can change. And we see that. Now there's a good relationship. There's a job that honors that person's interests and capabilities. There are friendships that are real we can make change. And I think that's, if anything, the most important message of all is there's a reason to do this, right? W which is that the change doesn't come one in a million. The change comes predictably if we do the things to look inside of ourselves and help ourselves. What's your message to the person that has been through a lot of traumatic stuff? Like they were abused as a child and their parents went through a bad divorce they were picked on heavily at school. And in, in, in many ways, their behaviors of how they're behaving and acting is in a way justified because of the events 
that they have like the sob story that they have it's 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 sad and people kind of buy into that but it's also not making their life better like what do you say to the person who is just constantly blaming their horrific past experiences for the way they're behaving in their adult life one way of putting an answer to that would be validate and challenge so the validation of the trauma if 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 something awful has happened in the person's past or just something that clearly was not okay or you know, did not predispose them to being out in the world and being at their best, like we want to honor and acknowledge that. Like it, it's real and true and, and we want to explore like how to make that person feel. What, you know, what were the results of that? So we're validating it, but then we're challenging its presence in their lives now, right? If I was bullied before, like why is that in my life now? Right. If something really bad happened to me in the past, right, why is it determining my decisions now? Why is it giving me some sort of sense either of stigma or some sense of right, you know, of having a, a right based upon the trauma in the present that is making dysfunction now? And big aspect of this is that the parts of our brain, the limbic systems, the basically the emotional systems in our brains don't care about the clock and the calendar. So it is very easy for then to be now, right? So if I'm acting based upon, you know, the fury that I felt or the fear that I felt 15 years ago or 20 years ago, however long it may be, that's because the part of my brain that most matters doesn't know that it's 15 years ago, right? And is feeling it as if it is now. So part of validating the trauma is also then putting it in its place. Like, yes, that happened to you 25 years ago, right? And we need to talk about that. And it's, of course, worthy of compassion, we want to explore it, right? But it doesn't determine your present, right? It doesn't give you a right to harm anyone in the present, including yourself. So you're here now and you're going to make decisions now, today. What are those decisions going to be? Are you going to be within yourself and within your best self when you make those decisions? Or are you going to make them based upon now being 25 years ago? So, you know, we validate what's gone on and how it has impacted and affected people, but we're also coming grounding to the responsibility we have for ourselves in the present. And we have a responsibility to not have that trauma from the past be active and deterministic in our present. And with all this said, do you think that a lot of these micro traumas, if enough of them happen, can stack up and equal like a massive trauma? Or do you think those two are inherently separate? So again, and we have real science answers to this. So I'll tell you what I think, but there's data and evidence behind this. So I want to make the distinction, chronic trauma, the trauma of bullying over time is it's like one thing that's happening over and over again. So as opposed to a car accident or a death, it is being bullied for years based upon some aspect of the person, right? So the chronic trauma can create the same brain changes, yes. And another aspect of, I think, what you're asking is uh, repeated traumas that don't reach the threshold of making brain changes within us. And yes, they can make us more and more and more vulnerable. So, you know, this idea that what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, absolutely 100% false, right? What doesn't kill us often makes us weaker and predisposes us to the next thing that could kill us. And you know, part of the truth of that is the multiple hit hypothesis, which says a person can have brain changes now that are consistent with all these things that we're talking about, maybe on trauma number seven, and maybe trauma number three seem much, much bigger than trauma number seven. But we have resilience inside of us, all of us, to some degree or another. And what we will see sometimes is there's an accumulation of the hits of trauma, the impacts upon the system. And then at some point, what can even be a more minor trauma in the grand scheme of things, now the brain is changed and the person can know that they are different because they know things have happened in the past and they felt the same afterwards. And now look, oh, I'm, I'm afraid my mood is low or I'm not sleeping the same. They, they can tell that something has changed in them. So yes, an accumulation of traumas of multiple hits can weaken our resilience systems and predispose us to even something relatively mild making brain changes that can change the course of our lives. It's no secret that a lot of people are struggling right now. Depression rates are up, anxiety rates are up, addiction rates are up. In your observation, like, what do you think is the main through line as the cause of people suffering today? I think that events, particularly events in the last several years from the pandemic 
have pushed more and more towards an environment of vulnerability and insecurity. You think how the news comes at us, you know, I'm in my fifties. And when I was a kid, I got one newspaper in the afternoon and it talked mostly about local news. And if something big happened somewhere else, it'd be in the paper. Now we can see over and over and over again, all the problems in the world around us, which are very real, how they have grown and how they may threaten us. And I think we feel less and less safe as we have felt more and more divided, right? So that is a very bad combination that the civility in our dialogue, the way that we use dialogue. If you imagine, you know, think about any contentious issue in our politics and what one side of that issue may be saying about the other. You know, often they're aggressive words. They're words that can be even threatening or menacing and people feel more divided, more threatened, not just by forces outside of us, like, you know, wars outside of our nation, but within our nation, the wars that have developed on social and political levels that are so divisive and raise such negative feelings inside of people, anger and fear and aggression, that often what comes to dominate us is a sense of isolation and a sense of powerlessness to make safety or to make change. And I think that has very, very much moved forward since the pandemic and since the divisiveness of the pandemic. And there's so many statistics and data to show us that as resources have continued to dwindle. It's, it's a bad combination of things happening inside and outside of the country that make us feel more isolated, more divided, more vulnerable. And that's just putting fuel in the engine of all of this and people with prior trauma find themselves triggered much more and much more fearful. And often people who did not have the impact of trauma now have it after, you know, clicking on hours and hours of news about the various wars and tragedies around. So very often what I'm saying to someone is a prescription for you is no more news. Or, you know, you look at the news to learn what is the news. And then, you know, you, you don't keep clicking through what ends up being a form of terrorizing ourselves inadvertently that just creates greater isolation and just a greater at times sense of hopelessness. Like, where are we going and how are we going to get there? And is this just going to be disaster? And I don't think it does not have to be that way, but our society has pushed more and more and more towards that. So obviously a single person can't change the world globally, right? but they're still in this world where there's a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of stress that's coming at them from external forces. What can people do on a daily or weekly basis to like navigate stress, anxiety, fear, trauma in real time? Again, th this may sound like a soft concept. My first answer to that is do something nice. Do something good for someone. Do something nice for someone around you, smile at the person at the checkout line, bend over and pick something up for someone who's dropped it, realizing that we have this goodness within ourselves, that we have this capacity right, to make the world around us better, even if it's just smiling back at you if you're frowning at me. right? It reminds us that there is energy and hope and the ability to make change around us. And we have to do that with the people who are right in front of us. And often it's gonna start with us. Like, can I say something nice to myself instead of that insult that keeps running over and over in my head? Can I do something nice for myself? Can I do something good for the world around me? Bring something good to eat to the person who's isolated and sort of shut in down the other end of the road, right? Like when we do these things, we really do make change in ourselves that then spreads out to the communities around us. So more and more of that affects family systems, right? It affects small social systems like people in a building or people on a street, right? And that affects how we may handle local political issues. And then that spreads out to our national dialogue. You know, this is real. It's real that if we start with ourselves, we start with the person in front of us, we make real change and we also make just change inside of us. Like if you do something nice for someone else, your own mood is better, right? You're less likely to be caught in the, the trauma that may be cycling around you, even if it's not the changes of trauma, just the fears in the world around us that we all have the ability to make the world a better place. And why don't we just start off with that in very, very small ways 
and see how that creates, you know, the pebble thrown into the pond that then creates the ripple effect. And that is, that is real and true. What do you think is the relationship between physical health and mental health? Well, it's extremely closely tied, right? Like we are one person, right? Mind and body and the brain is part of our body and the blood that's going through our toes is also going through our brains. So if we understand and recognize and accept how we are one and we don't embrace the mind-body separation, then we can understand how what we are thinking and feeling, right, what our mood is like, for example, affects what is circulating in our blood. So, which is why people with major depression are more likely to have heart attacks. Like, why would that be? Right? Because there's greater inflammation cycling around in the bloodstream. We're more likely to get autoimmune diseases. We're more likely to be fatigued. We're more likely to underperform, to have memory problems. If the blood that is flowing through us is filled with markers of distress, right? Fight or flight chemicals, chronic stress chemicals, inflammation chemicals, then it will affect us. And one example, I think probably this is the best example of this, is it makes us older than our age. Right? So these changes of trauma, as one example, can say, hey, if you look at the calendar, you might say, oh, that person is 40 years old. But if you could go in and look at within cells of like, how old is that person actually, right? How much is that person aged? You see a number greater than that. So if you're 40 by the calendar, but 45 by what's actually going on in your body, right? 75 by the calendar going on 90 because that's the actual changes inside the cells in your body. I mean, I don't know what better example there could be to tell us that this is affecting us from head to toe. So I think people get frustrated sometimes because they'll find something like psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, or they'll go to like a support group and it's not working for them. Like how long should somebody do you think try a method for addressing their mental health before changing things up? You know, I think the first way I would answer that is to say in the very moment, instead of letting something go on and then thinking, to stop and think, does this even make sense, right? I talk to how many people who are sitting in some mental health group they've been sent to by a system that doesn't want to spend the resources for individual psychotherapy. And they're sitting in a group that's about, you're change, taking your thoughts from one place to another, and that'll elevate your mood. And, and they know inside of them that like something awful has happened to me that this has nothing to do with, right? So first is to do a litmus test of rationality, right? Does this even make sense in the first place? And very often the answer is no. And if the answer is no, then full stop. Something then needs to change, right? Or if there's a sense that something may help, and it is not helping over time, if it is something being done with another person, to ask that person, right? To say, I'm coming, we're working together or whatever's going on that I came for change. I don't feel different, right? I don't feel like we're getting at what's going on inside. We have to advocate for ourselves, right? And we have to advocate for ourselves within systems that are allegedly set out to help us. And, you know, there isn't always an answer, but what do you do next? Or where do you go? But there's always something to understand better. Like if this isn't helping me, maybe it's therapy. Like, okay, what kind of work is this person doing? Let me talk to them. Maybe I need another therapist. or Maybe I need to learn more things. What resources are out there that I could read and learn? There's always more we can do for ourselves, but we have to start with the honest question of like, what is going on? And am I being helped? And I think one of the other struggles that people have is that they've had these struggles for like decades, like they're in their late forties, early fifties, or even in their sixties. And they've had these mental health problems for quite some time. They feel hopeless. or they feel like this is just the way they're supposed to be. Do you think there's like a certain time where it becomes much harder to transform your mental health? And what's your message to people that feel like they're just completely hopeless? I mean, the more that we're laboring under say a negative conception of self, the more that I might tell myself that I'm not good enough, the more likely I'm not good enough is to be going on in my mind. So, so your time matters in that sense, but in the sense that I think you're asking the question, a person can be helped and can change at any 
stage or any point in life, because often what has gone on is just the same thing over and over again, right? And that thing can be changed. So an example is a person might say, I've had, how many times have I heard, I've had five, six, seven awful relationships, right? So of course, I'm never going to have a better relationship or I've had lousy jobs my whole life. I'm going to have a better job now. And very often what has happened is not different things. It's just been the same thing over and over again. So it's not really six different relationships. It's kind of the same relationship six times. And often that's a very big source of hope inside of a person that often we find ourselves, we've been treading water in a place that is not good or not healthy, but the longer we're treading water there, the more we feel that we are anchored there and we are not anchored there. But if we don't do something to change that, we continue to tread water there. Right? And we have the repeated experiences that tell us, oh, nothing's going to change. It's always the same. Well, things often don't change and are the same until we do the things to change them. It's like, you know, if I'm standing somewhere and I say, I can't move from this place because I've been here for hours. Well, unless I'm going to put one foot in front of the other and move somewhere else, I am going to be in that place. But it, th this idea, again, of learned helplessness has been going on for so long, so it can't change. Right. As if then it has some magical import. I'm fated to this or oh, this is what God wants for me or I had this good thing. So now I get these bad things. And, you know, we start to make up stories that are kind of like black magic stories about why we're in a bad place or there's stories about something greater than us, you know, controlling us and being hateful to us as if we're marked or we're cursed in some way. And like, these things are not true. Often we've been in the same place, you know, not through a fault of their own. I mean, no one wants to be in that place, but if we don't know, I don't have to be here and I can move from here. Then we stay in that place and more and more feel like we can't get out of it. Do you think the intervention for somebody who's been like struggling for quite some time needs to be more intense? Or do you think that somebody who has been experiencing this negative sense of self that you just mentioned for decades can get by just simply developing better habits, developing better self-talk on a regular basis? Well, there has to be a frame shift in the person. I mean, if you, for example, the I'm not good enough has been running around in the person's mind, it's very, very difficult to then say, well, I'm going to change my life and I am going to go for that better job or that better relationship, right? I'm going to start changing things. I'm going to eat better and I'm going to get more sleep. It's very, very difficult to do that and sustain that, which is why people talk about they exercise and lose weight and then gain it back, or they go on a better diet and they're healthier. Then, then things go back to where they were, right? Because if we don't change the root of the problem, then it's likely that what we change on top of that root, you know, we'll, we'll go back to how it was before. But if we go to the root, like, why is it that I'm saying that I'm not good enough? All of them, what we can have is a frame shift. Like, let's challenge that. And you'll see at times where, you know, it might be months of, for example, psychotherapy for the person to really start seeing and making change. But it's not always that, you know, sometimes it, the light bulb can go off. Like, like, I've been saying this to me, to myself forever, right? And it's just somebody else's voice in my head. Like sometimes this has happened more times than I can count where someone might come in and I'm, I'm getting to know them and they're telling me about, someone who seems to be oppressing them. And I think like it's going on right now, this person saying they're not good enough and is, you know, or is physically injuring them is doing these awful things that make this person feel afraid. And sometimes I'll learn that person died 20 years ago, but it's still alive in the person's mind, you know, who is on the receiving end. And the realization that like, that's somebody else's voice in my head that came there from awful things that person did or said, but it's in my head now is this my voice. Right. And I don't want it to be. I want to definitely that is not my voice. And I want it to, to be outside of me now. I mean, it's remarkable at times how fast change can happen. And sometimes just remarking like, wow, like what you're talking about so makes me feel like that is happening in the present. And this person isn't in your life anymore. You've really taken inside, you know, this messaging. And now it is you. We take inside often the persecutor and the victim. So we feel, if we feel like the victim or we feel like that person has put me in this place or that experience, then we internalize the persecutor too. And we're keeping ourselves in that place, which is why someone can describe why things are so awful yesterday, today, and tomorrow because of something that is actively happening 20 years ago. It's not actively happening now, but it's active in here. And sometimes change takes time. Sometimes change is rapid, but that kind of realization 
opens up doors of hope and opens up doors that do lead to change one way or another. One of the other struggles I think people have when transforming or wanting to improve their mental health is patience. Because a lot of times when they're looking to improve their mental health, it's not like their life is perfect. In most cases, their life isn't going well. How can somebody remain present and be patient along the process of transforming their mental health? We have to have rational expectations, right? We live in a society that is very much about rapid gratification. And so we have to understand how long would I expect change to take, right? And what are markers along the pathway? And here again is where our mental health systems so often fail us. I mean, there was a time and it still happens where like 10 sessions of CBT was like the answer for everything, right? Whether small, medium, large, no matter what happened. So then you would see someone where you'd say a rational expectation is, for example, that person is going to need six months of real help. But the system is telling them everything's supposed to be completely done and finished in in two months and they're they're getting a kind of help that isn't what they need. So then at the end of two months, they're no better and they feel like a failure. Why? Because there's an expectation set that you're going to go and do this and on the other side, you're supposed to be better. But the expectation is not rational given what is inside the person. So we have to have an understanding, some idea of how long should this take? And a lot of times that's what in a clinical way we're doing with people who feel so bad or feel so hopeless because they've done things that may have made, you know, some real small change at the two month mark, but they see that as failure or the system sees it as failure. Whereas it might be that is a a really amazing and encouraging milestone that if you can get where you got in two months, even though that may be 10, 20% to where you need to go, like that's what we would expect, right? And what does it say? You're doing the right thing. You're on the right path. Keep doing this. Gain momentum. Now that you've done this, you can change other things too. Now we're setting rational expectations and we're setting rational landmarks along the way, as opposed to how long do I know, do I think change should take? If I don't know, why would I not think it's supposed to take a lot less than it takes? I mean, there's our rapid gratification society and the mental health system that doesn't frame You know, if you've been saying something to yourself over and over again for years and it's gotten your life to a place where you don't want it to be, like that's going to take time to change. Let's set out what that might look like. And do you think there's any proven metrics that people can track to see if they're actually improving their mental health? I think also what happens in our society is we so dramatically overcomplexify. I remember at one point looking at a whole set of metrics about a certain organization that was providing mental health to try and understand if they were helping people. And the truth is, I'm a psychiatrist and I couldn't understand them. Like, I have no idea what to make. It was so complicated and it's coming. Well, how did you feel, you know, before you came and then when you came and after you came and what happened along the way? And it's asking all these questions that just simplify and step back to like, look, you can tell if you're feeling different, right? You can tell if you're sleeping better. You can tell if you wake up and you have a feeling of dread or you start to feel some sense of optimism when you wake up. You can tell if you're not in an abusive relationship anymore. You can tell if you stood up to that person at work who's bullying you. How about just the rational inquiry of how do you feel and what's going on inside of you? Right. And that's what we need to do for ourselves, not metrics and questionnaires and all these things. I mean, sometimes there's data to get from that. If, for example, in therapy, if we're working together across time, we should be able to sit with one another and talk for a few minutes and take stock of things. Right. And have an idea across time of how we're doing and whether we're making things better. We can stop and sit with ourselves in that way and know if I'm trying to make changes, are they real? Do I feel different? Am I different? And sometimes they're associated with practical things. If part of that is I want to be in better shape or I want to be healthier and lose some weight, then, you know, we can attach it to something that's that's measurable. But very often it's the look inside of ourselves. Are we making change or not? And we can tell that. If somebody were to come to you and they were like, listen, like my mental health right now is in a place that I'm not happy with and I want to do what I can to transform it, like what would you say are some of the, the main tools they should implement into their life on a regular basis to transform their mental health based on everything we've discussed? There's so many 
possibilities. That what I would answer to that is I go back to the narrative. I would say, okay, I need then to understand something about you right, in order to answer that question. And, you know, you are you, right? You're not a statistic. You're not a, a grouping. You're a person who has a story and is coming and telling me, hey, I'm having mental health problems. I'm not happy with my mental health. Okay, let's talk about you. What is that? How that developed? Well, I'm depressed and I'm not sleeping well. Okay, what does that mean? When, you know, people mean very, very different things when they say that they're depressed. Okay, let me understand what that means to you. You're telling me you're depressed. How do you feel? That's just, what are you contrasting that to, right? Was, there's a time you didn't feel depressed. Okay, you're contrasting how you feel now to a time when you felt different and a time when you felt better. It's interesting that it was better and now it's not. What changed? in between, right? What has happened in between? What's the story of all of that? And then we, we start to get answers to the questions you're asking because we're looking at the individual person, right? And so there are many, many answers. There are many ways we can help ourselves. This is so far from hopeless and we are so far from helpless, right? But we have to look at ourselves. So again, if someone comes and tells me that I'm interested in that person, I wanna understand you and I wanna understand the story there. Maybe, for example, there's a long history of, of a biologically driven depression in that person's family. And actually nothing negative, nothing has really changed and life is going well, but they're becoming depressed. I mean, that might be a place where, you know, we, we used to look to pharmacology. Can we help that depression that's coming from these this sort of genetic or biologically determined path? Another possibility could be that there's no depression in this person's life or family or history, but something bad happened and they've been different since then. The pandemic, when they were shut inside, lost people that they loved, maybe got sick and were terrified. And, you know, since then they felt jittery and on edge and they aren't sleeping as well and mood goes down. So you see how dramatically different our stories are, our biology, our psychology, the social circumstances around us. And it kind of comes full circle to just taking a moment to pause and have compassionate curiosity about yourself. So if you're going to come and say, I'm depressed uh, or I'm, I'm not happy with my mental health, you have an idea of what that means when you're saying it and what the story may be behind it. You at least start putting that together because you've been curious about yourself. For the person who's listening to this or watching this, that maybe has a loved one that's just going through it. There's somebody who's in the thick of mental health problems and they're trying to get better. What's your advice for somebody to support a loved one, a partner, a child who's on this path of transformation? So often what we do when we're trying to help someone understandably is we're trying to problem solve, right? Uh, you know, what help can we get you? Where could you go? Or what could you do differently? Like, you know, get up and exercise more. We would come with some idea of trying to find a solution, right? And a way to approach anyone, if we're worried about them, we're concerned about them, is to approach with this compassionate curiosity, the same way that we should approach self. So if I know you and I see that you seem different to me, whether I know something's happened in your life or maybe I don't, or maybe we've talked about it, but we haven't really talked about what's going on inside of you, or to approach with, hey, I see that something's different. Or I don't know, but you seem different to me, or I know that we've been talking for a while about how you've been more down, like, talk to me about it. What does that feel like inside? Like, when did it start? What are your thoughts about it? When we approach people with an openness, I'm not trying to come to solve the problem. I'm going to know I see something and I care about you. And then I want to be receptive to what you have to say, or what you think about it. it. That can make immense difference because it doesn't feel good to not feel good. Right. And often if we're having mental health issues, we become defensive. They're stigmatized in the world around us. We don't feel like ourselves. You know, often we don't know, you know, am I myself? Am I being, am I behaving rationally? Am I crazy? Like we think these things and then we become more closed off. And if we're closed off outwardly, it's the same closed off inwardly. I don't want to look at what's going on inside me because I'm afraid of it. And I certainly don't want to talk to you if you come to me and tell me, hey, maybe I need some help. Right. But the idea of openness of like, it's just about, hey, What's going on inside, which like we can say that to ourselves and we can say that to each other. And many a conversation that has changed a person's life has started that way, just with the openness of like, how about make a situation where you can talk about what's going on inside of you. And maybe I'll talk a little about what's going on inside of me. We all have our issues one way or another. And this idea that, hey, 
we're in the same boat. I mean, a lot of how we're able to help people, we're all human. We all have our issues. We all have our problems. We all have things we don't feel good about. We all have our traumas in one way or another, even if they have not risen to the level of like the, the you know, the, the, the definition of the trauma that changes our brain, but we all have things that are going on inside of us. And if we're all in it together, where I'm kind of coming to you with that ethos, right? Of just compassionate concern and shared humanness, right? That opens doors that may have been closed for years and years, which is why just because something has been going on for a long time, doesn't tell me anything about whether it can change. You can tell me it's been going on for seven minutes or seven years. I want to understand what's happening in you and that compassionate curiosity and shared humanness often opens doors that were closed. And when you open those doors, we can walk through them, whether they've been closed for seven minutes or seven decades. Well, Paul, this has been an incredible conversation. Is there anything else you think the audience would find useful or helpful regarding understanding or assessing or improving or transforming their mental health? I think I would anchor again to how much we can understand and help ourselves by pausing and taking stock of what's going on inside of us. Very often we feel a sense of helplessness and we feel a sense of hopelessness, but it is because we are isolating ourselves. And I don't mean that we're living in a hole away from everyone else on earth, right? But what's going on inside of us, what's determining how I feel about life day in, day out is sort of stuck inside me. And the place to start is so often just letting myself be open and honest about what's going on inside of me. You know, our brains don't hate us. Our brains don't want us to be miserable. If our brains had hatefulness for ourselves inside of them, we would not be here as a species, right? So often we are afraid of what's going on inside of us. We become confused. We have these negative and oppressive dialogues, right? And then we start to feel that is we hate ourselves or God hates us or fate hates us. And these things are not true. We don't have to be afraid of what's going on inside of us. We can look at it. We can put words to it the same way when I was a kid and you'd get scared in the dark. And, you know, and I remember, you know, get scared and parent would come and turn the light on and show like, it's not a monster. It's a clothes hanger, whatever it be. Okay. I shine light on. I'm not afraid anymore because I'm looking at it. I can see it. I'm not left with my fears in darkness. And often we're left with our fears in darkness inside of ourselves, if we turn that light on, of what's going on inside of me? I don't have to be afraid of it. In fact, maybe what I have to be afraid of is looking away from it, right? And if I look directly at it, I can put words to it. I can do something about it. It's giving ourselves that permission. Again, the shame, the guilt, fear turns us away from this. So looking at ourselves is often the very thing we need to do. We can all do it. It comes for free right? We don't need to go to some system or have someone help us with it. We can stop and be with ourselves. And that's the thing to do. Look inside with compassionate curiosity. And I think we're often surprised at what we find and what a difference it can make to our lives. Well, Paul, thanks again for your time. I think the audience is going to get a tremendous amount of value from our conversation. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. You're very, very welcome. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.